Hello, and welcome to the Dentrepreneur Show. Hello, and welcome to Dentrepreneur Podcast. I'm Dr. D. Todd Russell. Um, today, I have with me back again uh, after a brief episode not too long ago, Mr. John Blair of John Blair and Associates. John, welcome back. Thank you, Todd. Glad to be here. Uh, John, you and I go back a number of years. We met over a transaction. My company has um, a bunch of dental practices in the Cleveland area. And uh, one of our first sales was uh, from you, from a doc that you represented. Thank you. The office is doing very well, continues to do very well. It's been a great transition for us. Well, glad to hear that. Yeah. But in addition to buying and selling practices, John Blair and Associates does everything from A to Z, except literally spin the drill for people, for the docs. So tell me a little bit about John Blair and Associates and your sons being involved in the in the company. So it, it, it's an odd story, Todd. Uh, I was in senior management in retail automotive years and years and years ago, 30 plus years ago. And I had a primary care physician who actually had delivered me as a child at a little private rural medical practice in Geauga County. We were talking one day and he was very frustrated about people owing him money. So as you know, back in the day, when you went to your family physician, you showed up and they sent you a bill. And insurance wasn't that prolific at that time. Anyhow, long story short, and this is back you know, a long time ago, he had a quarter million dollars in accounts receivables for which probably half were over a year old. So I said, well, you know, what are you doing about that? Long story short, I said, why don't I, I'll, I'll come in, I'll help you a little bit. Let me look and see what's going on in the office. And we were able to make a dent in the money that was owed to him. Frankly, he probably flushed fifty to $60,000 down the drain uh, that he didn't feel he could collect. And it intrigued me. And I made a career change a few years later and started with no clients and sent out some letters, uh, knocked on some doors, uh, actually volunteered for a dental research pro project to be able to make some contacts. And here we are 28, 29 years later, we've taken care of and served in some way, shape or form over 450 dentists, Canada, California, Florida. Our concentration though of clients are mostly in Northern Ohio. So, the crux of what we do is practice management training. And what that means is we're hired to find out what the dentist is struggling with and where the dentist may want to go. We identify that and then we put together our version, frankly, of a comprehensive exam. <laughs> and then we put a treatment plan together. So solutions to get the practice where it can be and handhold the dentist along the way. So we're not the typical consulting company where we fly in and then we fly out and then it's phone call. We're there. We're coaching along the way, ups and downs, breakdowns, breakthroughs. Um, and we support the practice and dentist essentially in achieving those goals. And we've been pretty successful at it. We also facilitate some study clubs. We speak at the residencies and the dental schools in the area. We um, help sell practices, value practices, sell practices, match buyers and sellers. And then Kyle actually procures associate doctors for practices that need associate providers. So that's the, but the core of Todd of what we do is the fingers in the dough, come into the practice and help the doctor get rid of the stress, the worry, the financial insolvency sometime and run it professionally, run it like a business, and then develop the team they really want to have. I know that was a little long-winded, but- No, no, no. It, yeah. You know what? Before we get into the the, the meat of my questions, I, I John, really, it, that story about with the physician translates to just about any small business. Right? Sure. You got in, right? And then you essentially self-taught yourself the metrics of dentistry. I got some baseline training in California years and years and years ago. But it was, Todd, it was maybe 10 to 15 to 20% of what I really needed to know. And um, I just took step by step by step uh, in learning and helping others with their practices. So it was a, a real process. By the time we were five years into it, I knew that we could really help 
a dentist get to where they wanted to go. And, you know, we were getting really good results. It wasn't uncommon for someone we started with to get a 20 to 30% increase in the first year and then maybe have a practice that work in the same hours, you know, less stress, twice as productive or twice as much in terms of revenue and certainly increase profitability. Yeah. Um, so one of the things I thought about calling this, this series of podcasts, um, interviews that I'm doing is the tangent cast, because, um, this is exactly what happens. You wind up on these tangents, but they're so, they so intrigue me. So further questions before, again, we get into the meat of things. Sure. You just mentioned your training out in California and, and 15 to 20% of what you really needed to know. Okay, so fast forward now, 29, 30 years later, right? Yeah. How much has the business of dentistry changed? Oh, geez, you know this. Yeah. Um, no, it's, it's 180. Yeah. Um, yeah, so we're, you know, we're seeing major consolidation. It's become apparent. And, you know, our physician friends went through this 25 years ago. Look around, you don't see a private practice, solo primary care physician anywhere. It's small groups, urgent care centers. So dentistry is quietly going through that same transition, I believe. And let's face it, you can practice dentistry with two or three doctors, three or four hygienists in one location more efficiently than you can in a solo location. Um, you know, dental supplies are going to be less expensive. Um, yeah. So, yeah, yeah, no, I know. I agree. It's change in the consolidation and, you know, we'll, we'll have uh, future conversations about the values of private equity, but as much as we all, especially in, on the private practicing side, you know, look at the, the money guys, if you will, uh, differently, uh, almost like a, a wart at times, they definitely bring validity to a practice from a business sense they understand how to but what they don't understand is how you get muddy and dirty and you know as you know what it takes to actually get into the weeds of a dental practice they can only manage from up above but still they have value but that's what they've brought to our industry and right frankly, it's for the better it is you know uh, cons- you, can't, you can't practice dentistry leisurely you have to practice dentistry if you're in private practice i believe efficiently if not quickly at times, you can still do great work and do it quickly. You have to have a well-trained team, I believe. You know, reimbursement from the insurance companies essentially has been the same over the last 10 or 15 years, yet dental supplies have gone up, rent's gone up. So more than ever, I think, with all the changes and things that are going on, it's those three columns, Todd. As a private practice dentist, you're a clinician, so you better be proficient in those areas, get confident in the things you're not that confident in, increase your efficiency as a, as a technician. The people part, which is get to know patients more effectively, why they behave the way they behave, so you're less stressed, the staff as well, and lead those people. And then the third part would be, so we have clinical people and the business column. So what is it that I need to know about PPOs? What is it that I need to know about how I should be billing? What sort of expense norms should I have? What should I be paying for staff? What should I be paying for lab? What should my rent be? And then what's a fair profitability? If I'm working hard and uh, doing the right things and I'm doing some baseline marketing, all those, you know, what, what should I expect? And then how much of that can I put away given some debt I might have to save for my future. Right. Yeah. So dental school teaches us how to do baseline dentistry, but it doesn't teach us how to run a business. No. And it certainly doesn't teach us, you know, how to get to a point where we're, we're financially independent and we develop the quality of life or the lifestyle that we want. Yeah. Oh, I couldn't agree. Things have to be learned. Yeah. Uh, let's, let's go down. Let's go back on track here a little bit and talk a little bit about, you know, again, the crux of my of this podcast is to help my colleagues who are thinking about retirement. And earlier on the, the the short episode we did, we talked about, you know, when should you start to prepare for an exit? And your answer was five years. And I, I wholeheartedly agree, although I think it actually starts, I say, at the age of 35, you've got your by 35, you've been out of dental school about 10 years. You can argue a little more, a little less, but about 10 years. You've got that 10, you've got that 
10,000 hours of clinical experience under your belt. You may have a couple years of managing a practice under your belt as well. And so now you really got the wheels spinning in the right direction. You're an owner possibly, or at least a partner in, a, in an office at 35 or thinking about being that one. Now is when it all starts, in my opinion. And you get a bunch of it done over 20 years. And then you get to that five-year mark, five years, 60 months left. Maybe, maybe you want to practice longer, but the full transaction needs to be done in five years in your mind. You, you touched on the business column. You know, I call it this magical term EBITDA that friends of mine made fun of me for this a couple of years ago when I said, you know, that term's been around for a long time, but it's only been around really more recently. No one ever threw that out 15 years ago. Right. Accounting majors knew what it was, but no one right. put out on a regular basis. So now you talk to dentists and their heads just explode. What What is this? You know, And so it's teaching them to understand these values and this more proper business setting, proper business reporting, so that they can speak the language when it comes time for their practices to be sold. And not just the dollars and cents as you discussed, but also the systems that are in place. The culture of the staff, culture is just as important as the revenue is. Okay, if you're looking, if someone, um, as far as someone is looking to sell or exit, let's get to that five year, they're, they're five years out. Um, what are the things that they need to have in place to really go to market? So they're five years out, they've got their practice is doing, let's say they're a single practitioner, they've got seven operatories, they're really working out of five, sometimes six, and they're doing a million five. Mm -hmm. Pretty good revenue for a single doc. Sure. Hygienist, two and a half hygienist. Sure. Right, million two is nice. Million five is doing pretty well. Right. Next five years, what are we going to start to lay out? What are we going to start? Where are we going to go first? So let's just say this up front. If that's the profile of the seller, then they're in the upper two to 5% of dental providers. Right. Yeah. If, that, if those are the to be, right? That's why I use that as my. Right. Most practices sold, you know, are doing revenues between five and 600,000. Yeah, the, that's the typical practice. So this would be a, a larger venue. And I have to tell you that whatever this dentist is doing, he's doing very right. So he understands efficiency or she understands efficiency, put together a good team to get to those numbers of a million, four or five. You got a lot going right in your practice. So then the question is, okay, how profitable is the practice? What's the physical plant look like? What's the active patient base look like? We look at something called recare effectiveness is, you know, 45% or 85% of the active patient base being seen for regular preventive care. I think the question was, you know, what does that doctor have to start preparing for? Just, you know, oh, documentate records and uh, monitors and reports and you know, timely financial statements and tax returns. So be impeccable in your paperwork and in your um, your business reports. And like I said, financial statements, P&L statements, all those good things. Um, John, one thing. Up, up to date software. Yeah. In the, in the office. Right. I mean, there's Technology in general, right? Yeah. We, we actually have a list, a checklist <laughs> for practitioners to start working on. And we put that over to the associate or the potential buyer too. Here's what you might be looking for. Right. And well, uh, in, in any more, a uh, young dentist graduating, number one, I, um, I don't know if you've gotten into the uh, chat GPT or AI uh, type thing, but I was, I was playing around with it and I put in the average debt of a dental student. You know, we all hear these numbers. And so with undergrad, it's approaching 400,000. Yeah. Debt, all this money. And, but what they know is technology based dentistry. So I think one of the buckets that you've got to prepare for is the technology side. Are you up to speed on technology? Because sure. whoever you're going to bring in, whether it's the buyer or the, if it's the buyer, you're going to add more value. If it's the associate, you're going to attract better, right? Or you're going to attract anybody who, because that's what they, that's all they know. Correct. Um, in, in talking about this, you know, you would, you're, you're ready to go to, you're thinking you're ready to go to market. But you need to surround yourself with some important people. And we talked earlier about in dental school, you really aren't taught business, right? But we are told you need a good accountant and a good attorney. Okay. An accountant can do your taxes, but do they know dentistry? Correct. Big difference. Who? Yeah. 
They may have done small business. And again, we're talking about small businesses as well here, but are they doing, are they, do they have someone who understands the business of dentistry? Just like we said, the, the multiples, the private equity, do, are they familiar with that? That's one, two. An attorney, the same thing. An attorney can reveal contracts, but we're talking about mergers and acquisitions. And we know that there are, just like there are doctors who specialize in certain kinds of medicine, there are attorneys that specialize in that. And the third, and I think more important, is a guy like you. It is a, it, even a guy like me. I mean, I, I've got enough experience. You need... I call us a strategist, not a consultant. Perhaps you're going to walk in and you're going to change everything. I may walk in and just say, you need to have John, you need to hire John to do these things. I'm not necessarily going to do it for you, but nonetheless, I feel like there's this missing third party and that is this strategist consultant that's going to help you over the next five years. And it's the old spend a dollar to make 10. Would you agree with that? I mean, I kind of went off. It was a long way to ask a short question. Yeah, I, I think in addition to, you know, a, a facility that looks nice, it doesn't have to be high end, you know, mahogany and chrome and waterfalls and foot massagers and, and a champagne bar in the corner and baby grand piano, but just something that's neat, clean, state of the art. Equipment is solid, good software, up to date x-ray stuff. Um, you know, I, I there's so many ways to, to look at a practice and say, okay, how, how can you get it prepared to maximize the, the selling price? In the end, Todd, as we know, it's the numbers. How profitable is it? In addition, you could say, okay, what's the upside? The other thing you have to ask yourself is, okay, if this dentist that you just described is collecting a million five, can the buyer come in and duplicate those efforts and those results. Well, it, yeah. Affordability. If they can't duplicate it, they can't afford to buy it. That's correct. But that then becomes a plan where we can let the associate buy it off in chunks, right? So over your five-year plan, you sell a little bit each year to that associate. Maybe it's a combination of dollars, a combination of sweat equity, right? right? But there can be a plan, and that's why it's important to start this process, maybe even start at seven years, knowing in two years you're going to get an associate. Oh, when I said five years, five years minimum. Right. A right. Absolutely, yeah. You know, and the other thing is this practice I was talking about, you know, this hypothetical practice that's doing really well. Um, you know, the doc may have moved into a new building seven years ago and has the owns the building, which can be great owning real estate, but they're in debt $600,000. I know you focus on debt reduction with your clients. Big time. You're five years out. I'm talking to you and planning what I need to do to get my systems in place, maybe upgrade technology, which could be another debt event. But you're focused on getting rid of that debt because if you sell a practice, a million five practice, you sell it for a million five and you have 600K in debt. That's right. Or buys it, the debt's eliminated. So now you only get 900. That's right. Then you have taxes. And all of a sudden, that million five is five, six hundred thousand dollars because you know that's right. it takes a fair chunk of that. That's right. You know, it wasn't worth it. That's why you need to start earlier. Absolutely. Yeah. Now, remember that 35 year old, though? Yeah. We have to remember they probably have one or two young children. They have four hundred thousand dollars or three hundred thousand dollars worth of uh, school debt. They probably have a three, four or five hundred thousand dollar home mortgage. Hopefully they're not driving as they did in dental school, a 1997 Honda Accord standard shift with a cracked windshield and 200,000 miles and the air conditioning. So they're driving a decent car and they're trying to make sense of this practice thing. Yeah. yeah. So there, there's, uh, I, I agree, the earlier the better. However, there's this thing called life that a lot of private practice dentists are uh, sort of balancing with the business of the practice. And it's hard. And, and you know what? Here's what I found in working with 400 plus dentists. It can get lonely. It can. Dentistry can be a lonely craft. You're the last one out of there. You've got payroll due in two days and the checkbook is shaky. Lots of debt. Maybe this case four days ago didn't go well. And I think it's very important for a private practice dentist. Now, this is self-serving. Yeah. They have a professional that on hand that they can go to sort through some of these things, stay focused, stay positive, work through their challenges, and eventually get where they want to go. It's 
I love dentistry as a healthcare profession. I would not want to be an OBGYN or a podiatrist. Nothing wrong with those. I think dentistry is fantastic, but it's more difficult than ever to sort through all those things it takes to know in private practice, to balance your life, get ahead financially, and you know what? Feel good about your craft. Feel good about the dentistry you're doing, the impact you're having on the community with their oral health. Um, I, yeah. um, I have a story, John, um, and it touches on exactly this. So growing up, I middle-class family, dad worked, mom worked. One of my best friend's dads was an MD thoracic surgeon. Our family dentist was a female dentist, um, and she practiced out of the basement of her house. Oh, what I loved about that was, you know, she was always home. I mean, she was a mom, which growing up in the 70s and 80s, it was still the 50s and 60s and that the mom was home and the dad worked. And I mean, that started to transition now. And, and thank God, because quite frankly, women are better in the workplace than us guys, right? But I saw the difference between, you know, my friend's dad, and our family doc. When I saw him, he was laying in a Barco lounger with, you know, eye shade blacks over, what do you call those, a mask over his face, catching yeah. him on sleep. Yeah. When I saw her, it was at some cocktail party on the golf course, always out at her kids' baseball games or whatever, which touches on our profession. Our profession really does provide you the best work-life balance as far as being in the world of medicine and then having that balance, you can create your own schedule. Absolutely. You want. Um, yeah. You have to learn as, money as you or as much as you want. That's right. Um, and medicine, that's no longer. Now I got buddies. Hey, you want to go play golf on Friday afternoon? Oh, I can't. I, I work. Oh, yeah, right. that's right. You're tied to this XYZ hospital that, you know, you only get three weeks a year. And we don't have that. We have the luxury to cancel our schedule if we want to. Sure. Advise that if you got a full schedule, you know, you should be producing. But yeah. uh, it is nice to have that. So. And John, we've got a few minutes left here, and I've kind of, you know, I, on my shows, I prep everybody with some questions I'm going to ask, and I want to skip to this one because it's, I think you can tell some great stories. Tell me about one of the most successful or fun transitions, transactions that you had so far in your career, you know, the colorful person or the situation. Now, you two quick ones, 66-year-old dentist with $100,000 saved, and I, I'm, I'm sorry, 62. $100,000 saved and uh, give or take about $150,000 in debt. So it was going to be a little bit saved and a social security check. And essentially with tears in his eyes, this is a practice out, out near Parma. He said- It's uh, south of Cleveland, if you're not from the Cleveland area. Yes. Suburb of Cleveland, middle class, lower middle class area, everyday people. And he said, uh, I'm scared to death. I'm worried. And what am I going to do? And I said, one thing, what's the plan? He said, we don't have a plan. I said, okay, let's do this first. I'm not going to give you what I think you should do. Tell me what you want. And if it's within reason, and I believe we can get there and you believe we'll put things together to make it happen. So got rid of the debt. Sold the practice for a million six at 66 and a half. Sold the practice for a million six. And it was like someone pulled a cement truck off of his chest. Yeah. The other one I'll tell you about has more to do with just big profit and right place, right time. A practice that was doing give or take four million in revenue with no debt. Um, sold it for, you know, mid eights. And the dentist is 47, staying on as a provider, owns the building, still getting rent, and um, essentially took his money off the table. And uh, it was saving quite a bit prior to that. But yeah, that those are life changers, deals like that. Still wants to do dentistry. And uh, it was you know, an 85% advance. And the fifteen percent was rolled over into the bigger venue, but yeah, that was and that's a, that's a great thing there too. I, I mean, I'm seeing a lot more of that in you know not necessarily with private equity, but with the larger groups. They're requiring the doctors to stay on, and these deals where you get you know a big uh, you know someone buys controlling interest, and then you roll the rest of the equity. 
it keeps you engaged as far as producing goes, but then you can structure your your buy down so you can take out you know five percent a year over the next five years, and the company doesn't get hurt by your exit. That's my company personally. That's what happens. We where we got hurt was when we let a doctor leave right. after transaction. And we didn't have someone nearly as good or as polished to take over that practice. You know? That's right. And so you need a, a slower transition in order. And quite frankly, if you're if someone's willing to pay you these large numbers for your practice, and granted, you've done all the hard work, you've you know got it systemized, you've got it equipment up to you know highest technology standards, and staff is run well, and the profitability is there. If you're going to sell it to somebody, it shouldn't be a, you know, it's your problem now kind of a thing, right? You should take some ownership and some pride in the fact that you want to see this this perpetuation and you should be a part of it. And if you can make it more lucrative for you, you can get a higher valuation with the second and third little sell off. That's right. You take advantage of that. That's right. Yeah. You don't want to work the luxury to to work because you want to, not because you have to. Yeah, the buyers want predictability. And when the the main provider stays, there's you know a, a predictable revenue stream, new patient flow, relationships are in place, less staff attrition. So, and when the number's big enough, the selling doctor, yeah, I'll stay three years, sure. <laughs> well, Mr. John Blair, a handicap index of you know approaching pro level. Yeah, right. Sixty to hundred rounds a year. I'm yeah, sure your clients don't want to hear that. Um, Nonetheless, I look forward to some golf with you this summer Sure, here in Cleveland. I want to thank you so much for being on my show. I hope you've enjoyed it. I've totally enjoyed it. Every time I talk to you, I pick up something new and I can't thank you enough. I don't even want to say I, I wish that we had the opportunity to work together. I'm not certain now with where my company is, if I if it's right. But nonetheless, I know we'll maintain a friendship and we'll be colleagues for a long time to come. John, how can people reach you if they want to talk to you more? So uh, we have a website, johnblairassociates.com, J-O-N, blairassociates.com, jblaircoaching at gmail.com, the letter J, blaircoaching at gmail.com. Phone numbers are on there. Our backgrounds are on there. All the services we provide are, are on the website. So they can get a hold of us morning, noon, or night, and uh, we'll follow up quickly and uh, at no charge try to help them understand how they can get maybe where they want to go with our help. And um, I think we're one of the few, I haven't met anyone lately that when you pay us a fee to help you, we guarantee that you'll get that fee back that you pay us within one year or we refund every dime. So there's no risk, truly. Now there's a caveat. You have to implement what we share with you and teach you. Right. Yes. Yeah. Right. So if you do that in earnest, uh, you'll get back what you spend on the training and the support services that we have. Uh, I want to leave you with one thing. Can I do that real quick? Absolutely. Please. Have you read the book about John Rockefeller? It's called Titan. I have not. So John Rockefeller grew up in Strongsville, Ohio. Mm -hmm. He's buried in Lakeside Cemetery in Cleveland. Mm -hmm. And his worth at the height of his career was the worth back in the day in those dollars, what Bill Gates and Warren Buffett are combined. Incredible, yeah. Absolutely incredible. Yeah, and uh, so he, he wrote a little poem when he was 84 years old, and I wanna share it with you. I love it. He said, I was early taught to work as well as play. My life has been one long happy holiday, full of work and full of play. I dropped the worry along the way and life was good to me every day. I love that. That's fantastic. Yeah. I did not know that. Yeah. Wow. All right. And John D. Learn something new every day. I'm going to look that up and actually copy that and put that on my desktop. I'm a big uh, Vince Lombardi fan. So I have his uh, what it takes to be number one speech in the background on my desk. And, you know, but now I think I have a poem to uh, to follow. That is fantastic. Yeah, it's pretty cool. Again, John Blair, thank you so much for being on my show. I appreciate it. I will have you back in, in the time, you know, down the road next couple of months. Um, but in the meantime, I'm sure we're going to uh, settle some things on the golf course soon. Thank you, Todd. I enjoyed it. Take care. 
Thank you for joining us. Please follow or subscribe to this show on Spotify, Apple, or YouTube. If you would like further information or to meet with me one-on-one and discuss your practice, please feel free to contact me through my website, dentrepreneurllc.com. Many more exciting guests and topics are headed your way.